In 1973, Edward Van Halen had graduated high school, formed a band that bore his family name, and had already decided that music was to be his future. Taking this road, however, wouldn't come without sacrifices. It really hit me like a brick wall when I graduated high school, and you know, you signed everybody's yearbook, and everybody asked you, so what college are you going to? Uh, hey Al, I think we better stick to what we know. We watched all of our friends go to college, get their lives started. We spent five and a half years wondering. Five and a half years of constant, endless practice. It was small steps. It wasn't this big dream that we had. It was basically uh, the need to survive. While the commitment to music was clear in Roth, Edward and Alex, keyboardist Jim Pusey, who had played with the brothers for about a year, would depart and bassist Mark Stone was torn between rock and roll and academic achievement. I was like split between these two things and basically I just couldn't keep up with it. I'll never forget playing at the Velasco's party, which was like a semi-weekly bash that we'd play. I remember Mark's parents came and they just take him home in the middle of a song. Yeah, because we were a bad influence on him. It was tough leaving that band because I knew they were, they were destined for greatness. It's just like they say, you know, don't leave before the miracle happens and I did. It didn't take long to find a replacement, however. Michael Anthony Sobolewski had previously loaned his band Snakes PA to the brothers after Van Halen's equipment had broken down during a show at Pasadena High School. His generosity, as much as his playing, hadn't been forgotten. I got a call from uh, Eddie and Alex one night. They asked me to come over and jam with them. We jammed and jammed, and they put me through every kind of beat change they could think of. And when we were through playing, they asked me if I'd like to join the band. And my mouth kind of opened up a little bit, and I went, uh, sure. As much as his ability to fill in musically, Van Halen could see the potential in what their new bassist could add vocally. We were all tripped out. Mikey was lead singing for his band. Dave was fronting his own band, and I was too. And we all just kind of got together. Mike Anthony was so unique. His bass playing, yeah, we can find bass players. But nobody sounds like that. That's Garfunkel. Simon's good. Simon Garfunkel. Thus, the classic Van Halen lineup was solidified. But still, a breakthrough remained elusive. Nobody wanted anything to do with Van Halen. For a good seven years, we knocked on everybody's door, and everybody just said no. So what we did was we started faking it straight to the people. Playing everywhere and anywhere, from backyard parties to places the size of your bathroom, everything. We printed our own flyers and stuffed lockers at high schools. We played high school. We played everywhere. Whether you liked us or not, you definitely had heard of us. Building a committed local following, the group started to get a reputation for the rowdiness of their shows. Well, I'll never forget we played a backyard party once. It was written up in the paper. Nineteen people got busted and stuff. And four cop cars were turned over. Uh, a group of guys took one cop. They took his handcuffs and handcuffs and went on a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Though the quartet still mostly managed themselves, and despite their share of moments and gigs where things didn't work, the band's momentum and the size of the local audience gradually but steadily grew. Slowly, we built an audience of about three to 5,000 people. We would promote our own shows to Pasadena the Pacific Auditorium. We really tried to build up a following rather than look for a record contract. We just humped it and humped it and humped it until people came. We'd say if the following is there, then at some point, somebody's gonna have to stand up and take notice of the band. Eventually, someone did. Van Halen had already made their debut on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, landing some gigs at the less heralded club Gazzari's, where one night they were spotted by known Los Angeles tastemaker and DJ Rodney Bingenheimer. We just kept playing, doing our Pacific shows. And then Rodney Bingenheimer saw us and said, you guys are all right. Why don't you play at Starwood? Though they now had some of LA's hottest music clubs within reach, by 1976, Van Halen was clearly no overnight success story. For their 21-year-old guitarist, however, there was never a doubt about whether he'd made the right career choice or what the group meant to him. I always thought Van Halen was going to be something special. To me, Van Halen was special when we played backyard parties. Right from the very beginning, even when we were nobody, it was the main part of my life. 